Ladies and gentlemen, very good evening. Warm well, welcome to the Alan Ruff Lounge tonight then for the Jacks Foundation Information Evening. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we kind of get going tonight. Obviously, you're a final alarm, head for one of the doors, etc. as well. Uh, also, I uh, was going to make a joke about the pitch tonight. Obviously, we saw some uh, better times of the park there, not looking too good tonight. And being a, a resident tractor driver, I was checking it for potatoes earlier on, but uh, that might just be a bit early for that kind of joke. Anyway, uh, tonight, uh, coming up, it's basically an information evening for you to find out more about uh, the Janks Foundation. Our board members are all here tonight as well. There'll be a chance to answer some or ask some questions this evening. Uh, we do ask that you maybe keep those questions to the end of the night tonight. Uh, we will go round about with the microphone. Uh, we'll ask you to put your name out there and then we'll answer the questions. Uh, Alan uh, Heron tonight will be answering the vast majority uh, of the questions. We'll also be hearing tonight from um, David Brown, Andrew Donnelly and our chairman uh, Gavin Taylor as well will be having a chat with us this evening. But basically tonight it's a chance to find out just how the Jacks Foundation will be run, the role of the majority shareholder, but more importantly we're looking for your feedback and input tonight as well. And that's really what this event is all about and hopefully it doesn't descend into what happened at Falkirk a couple of weeks ago. So we'll try and keep a, as much of a lid on that as we possibly can. There's a little bit more class at Furhill than there does seem to be in Falkirk. So anyway, like I say, the Q&A and a tonight, please, whatever you do, don't think there is a, a stupid question. There really isn't a silly question. Anything at all that you want to ask, ask it. We'll come to you as, as quickly and as promptly as we can. If there is maybe something from a legal standpoint that you want to ask tonight, uh, Stuart, our legal legal, is down the front this evening, so he will be on course and on hand to answer any sort of questions uh, like that as well. So please, like I say, there are no silly questions. There's nothing out here that anyone's going to laugh. But it, at the end of the day, it's a very big thing as to what could be happening with fan ownership, which a lot of you will already know about. But first of all, we're going to bring up the chairman, Gavin Taylor, to introduce himself and exactly what it's all about. Gavin Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm Gavin Taylor. I'm the chairman of the Jags Foundation. Um, tonight, as, as, as uh, Ga other Gavin uh, notified, um, you, we have the rest of the directors of Jags Foundation here. And if you don't know, there's Alan Heron, Stuart Carlison, Stuart Rennie, Carmen Mackey. We've also got Andrew Donnelly here. We've also got some members of our working group, Craig Dunn and David Brown, with us as well. Um, we've really two main targets tonight, as Gavin was saying. Um, we want to update the current members of the Jags Foundation, those that have, have joined up. We want to give you an update of where we are, what we're doing and how we're, how, how we're progressing and, and what we've still to do. And also for those that are not members, we hope that the presentation tonight helps you decide to join the Jags Foundation and be part of this, of this group to, to move forward. So, Anyway, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Andrew here, who will kick off the proceedings. Thank you. Um, speaking to a, a room full of Thistle fans, a kind of new experience for me. Uh, Any time I generally um, speak publicly about the club, I've got a, a Twitter mask on, or, or in the Jagcast, and Jagcast and a, a quiet pop, so please be gentle. We can have lots of differences of opinions about the how of fan ownership. 
But the why of ownership is the most important thing. So tonight I want you to think about why you're all here. We all have one thing in common this evening, the love part of us. Thanks to the late Colin Weir's love for the club, Thistle fans have been given a unique opportunity to become the latest football club across the sporting world, to become masters of their own destiny and own their own club. Across sport there are literally hundreds of clubs run by, by the very people that have the club to heart. From the world-renowned Green Bay Packers in the America's NFL, to a couple of the world's biggest sporting institutions, Real Madrid and Barcelona. In fact, in La Liga's fourth most successful club, Atletico Bilbao, they are also owned by fans. In countries like Germany, where they have the highest average attendances in world football, the lowest ticket prices, and a great fan culture, it's not permitted um, for clubs to be owned by a single entity. There are many, many examples, both here in the UK and across the wider football world, of fanship, but far too many to get into tonight. So if we look at high profile fan ownership groups here in Scotland, those of probably Hearts and Mullerwell, the biggest, highest profile ones, and both clubs are now stable financially, it are now starting to prosper, both on and off the pitch, I think, uh, due to the foundation of ownership. There are eight clubs of various sizes, in Scotland that are wholly fan owned and another 13 are minority uh, uh, owned um, so it's not unique to, to us fans at Thistle. However, what is completely unique is that we've been gifted the club to the tune of around £5 million pounds by the late Colin Weir. Both the aforementioned Motherwell and Hearts have had to pay back money to owners whereas every penny raised by our fans will put into the club push the club forward. So fan ownership is not unique to the local communities of the larger footballing world. So who are we as a fan base? When people look at the average game, it's been last day a couple of thousand down against Morton, they're going to say it's not going to work, okay? And we've got a fan base to do this. Tonight, I'm hoping to pitch things from a different perspective towards you. Throughout our time, it just as fans and working group, um, we spoke to lots of people with Thistle connections and we found that everyone has a different level of commitment for, for Thistle that they all love the club dearly. Some go to home and away games, never miss a game in fact. Um, some even hire a bus and go to Inverness and the cold snowy Wednesday night. Um, some buy a season ticket and go to all the home games. Some can't make it to all the matches because, they simply can't because work commitments, family, um, health, location, travel restrictions, they all love still, they all still love this daily. I had an uncle yesterday, um, he was in Paris now celebrating his 60th birthday, not been for, for, for years, he texted me last night saying, I can't believe we lost to Morton on my 60th typical thistle. But he still calls us we, still sees himself as a fan. There are literally thousands of us that love thistle. The Jack's Foundation is also for fans who are unable to go to matches. You know who they are. You know, those who spent their match days refreshing the teletext in the old days to get the live updates when you wouldn't get any coverage from the telly. Nowadays, of course, you can refresh the, the, the club's Twitter page or, or listen to the radio commentary from Michael and the team. Um, some fans spend a lot of money on um, every piece of merchandise that the club produces. Birthday presents, Christmas presents, we want to spread the joy, don't we? Um, some in holiday clothing. Um, Greaves have been delighted with their partnership with Thistle. Uh, and it's been a real road of success for them, especially for the overseas fans who obviously don't come with a that regularly. Some fans a bit older uh, and struggle with water on the hill at the city end, uh, or even sitting in the cold, long, long winters here in, 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 in Glasgow these days. Some put their hard earned cash into sponsoring players' kit or sponsoring advertising boards. Some in recent years have even paid to become uh, a fully paid up member of the playing squad, although thankfully none of them have ever made an appearance. Um, some of the social side things have been a thistle fan and spend a lot of their money on hospitality. Uh, they bring along their family, their friends, their colleagues, because they want them to experience the same um, you know, the same kind of joy that they get being at Furrow. Some, some, some of us love meeting friends in the thistle suites of the local pubs, having a few drinks and a chat about the game, or even indeed afterwards a good sing song on a karaoke that would some spend hours sharing stories, memories, old photographs, newspaper articles, 
on social media or watching and sharing opinions and having debates on club matters. Some on social media simply love battering the old firm. Old uh, Airdrie commander, the Dundee clubs, Clyde Falker, I missed them, maybe more than after last night. But all of us, we all have something in common. We all bleed red and yellow. There are really important things in our lives, our family, our friends, our health, our safety. But we all have one thing in common. Party Thistle defines us. It's in our DNA. When people patronisingly tell us that a ah, Party Thistle fan they know, they're talking about you. We are unique in Scottish football in that we play in a city with two giants. And we're universally respected for choosing the club that we love. Now, you will, you will hopefully get more clarity after tonight about fan ownership. But if I can give you a little spoiler ahead of tonight's presentation, this will not be a fan-run club. It will be a fan-owned club. The club will still be run by a board of directors as it is now. As fans, we appoint the board of directors and they will be responsible for running the club. We've got very good sources of revenue at our club. Part of this is a very well-run club. Um, any additional revenue we bring into the Jacks Foundation will benefit the club in the way every single person in this room wants. So, what do we want from you? Apart from your complete backing, of course. I'm sure we'll get that. Um, well, the easy thing is to say we, we need you to sign up and give us your money, okay? But we need to be a credible organisation. The more members we have, the more credible we are in the eyes of the board. But it's really important for you to feel a part of something special. Imagine raising the amount of capital we can to strengthen our club and have the directors accountable for how they spend it. I mean, we are kind of halfway towards our first target and that will bring in around, around £100,000 per year. And that's without kind of going out and, and, and speaking to your guys that are fans publicly. And that's a huge sum of money for any club to have at its disposal. Believe it or not, the Hearts are statistically the most successful fan owned club in the UK and they bring on over £100,000 per month in subscriptions. Now, I'm not going to stand here in front of you and say we're going to take our crown off them in the first year, but the sky is the limit for us. You know, but it can only happen if we join together and we create a scenario of interest. I'm sure many of you already realise, in fact, you probably do as you're here, and uh, if not, I hope you do it by now that this is a really important part of your life. So, just before we move on to, to, to the next part of the presentation with David, he was going to go into more of the specifics. Um, I just want to leave you with this little thought. Kind of like it or, like it or not, Partick Thistle is in our blood. We are defined by being Partick Thistle fans. Let's take this once in a lifetime opportunity, get together, spread some joy, and back up love to do incredible things for us all. Okay? Thank you. So give me one second if you'll just tee this up. Welcome again, thanks for coming out in such an absolutely miserable night and apologies on behalf of us all for having to cancel last week but I think it was also the right thing to do um, as much as it caused some pain for everyone. Um, I get to do the dry bit, so this is the kind of specifics about where we are in this whole process of fan ownership. Uh, I'll get through this as quick as I can. The presentation will be available after, so if some of it you miss and you can't talk to us after it, by all means look at it, come back with any questions you've got at any particular point in time. Um, if we go on to here, these are discussions we'll go through. The first four uh, I'll probably cover, as I say, we'll get to our current and future state piece. And then the bit at the end is probably where we need most of the interaction from everyone in the room here. Um, we're taking this to a point of fan ownership, but to Andrew's point, he was elaborating on there, but what else do we need from it? Where do we need this club to be? What can we do when we have that ownership? Not just simply be a holding company of the majority of shares, 
that actually what can we actually tangibly do? And we well, I openly admit we don't have all the answers for that. In fact, we probably don't have many answers for that. And that's why we look to you guys and ladies to come back and say, look, how about some of these ideas? And we can then ferment them and then we can start to put them into action. So first off, I appreciate that some of you have already been on this uh, road. They know a lot about what's going on. I really want to share some of these figures and, and, and models with you here to get everyone grounded in, in the same place. So the Jacks Foundation is actually a company, an entity that has been set up specifically to take on Colin Weir's legacy, to take that 55% ownership into the, the ownership of the fans. Currently that is retained by three black cats, and part of the process here that we'll go through is showing how that then transfers to the Jacks Foundation and we take that majority ownership. So the company itself says it's a private company, limited by guarantee, that is, that's important because there's a lot of discussion about the risks that are involved in this and what happens and you know, do we take on this liability. There is no liability for us and this is a gift of shares that we will take into the company and as members of this, effectively shareholders, you have no major liability. Sure, correct me if I ever say anything or, or, or on this. Um, we're going to have nine directors on the board so those people will be in a separate company uh, and in order to get continuity, every year three of those director positions will be up for re-election. So we don't get stagnant, we don't have people in positions for too long, but we do have continuity to make sure that as decisions are made, they get carried through, we don't have this up and down response year, year after year. There is an AGM coming up, um, I think Alan would mention that, that later on. A lot of what we're putting in place just now will both be up for discussion and agreement at that AGM. So that should be in place. And then, other than that, there will be further communications made. I think some feedback we've had before about things have gone quiet, we don't think things are working. That's all been put into place and, and being, being corrected. Um, so it's our role here, maybe over the pudding a little bit, but you know, Andrew said here, it's fan wound, not fan run. But at this point in time, the our voice within the board is probably not as specific excuse me, as it should be. So we will effectively be the majority shareholder. We will be able to influence the board and ultimately be able to pick the board. But that is already in place. That is currently the situation with Barney Thistle Football Club right now. We're not changing any of that. We're not acquiring a company. We're not merging a company. We're not taking over. We are setting up a separate company that will be the major shareholder of Barney Thistle Football Club. Picture sometimes um, pays a thousand words. So very, very simply, this will be the Jags Foundation here. The members, you folks, and hopefully some more of you, will be appointing the board of directors. We will be part of the overall party thistle shareholder the setup. We will be influencing the board of directors, who will be running the club through Jerry and Ian and, and the team there. It seems quite it seems quite simple, but again, I apologize for all the diagrams here, but that's why I say we'll have it ready for you to look at it again. But the shareholders own the club, no one else owns it but the shareholders. And right now, of those 1 million A shares and 13 million B shares, 55% of that lies with the three black cats, which is effectively called Weir's gift. 20% or 19.8, might be the right number, is in the PTFC Trust. And then there's 25% other amongst various other shareholders, etc. Right now, the Jags Foundation, you'll have nine directors. It's been formed from the working group, so we just haven't sprung up. This has been through many long discussions and, and many long forums to get to this particular stage. And fundamental in our constitution is one member, one vote. So we don't have any pool votes, group votes. Every member has their own vote when anything's decided. Partick Thistle, we've got 10 members of the directors on there. They don't have a fixed term. The directors are appointed, they're appointed until they either move on or somebody else decides that they're not going to carry on doing what they're doing. Right now, from the fan base, four of those directors are related to either Thistle Groups or, as in Gavin's case, part of the foundation. And then you have the actual team itself, the operations staff here at the ground, and, and the ground itself under Jerry. So that's, that's actually the current state. And when the share ownership changes, 
the only thing that really happens is that majority of fan ownership moves down to the Jags Foundation. All of the rest of it still works under the current way in which it works. There are no major changes at that point of, of transfer of fan ownership. To make it clear, there is two separate companies. Both of them have articles of association, which are the rules in which we run things. And right now, Partick already have established a, a article of association. I remember when was, when was that final Do you remember the date? This own articles. I think the last amendment was about 2011. 2000. So it's been established for a, for, for, a, for a long time. The important part here is, is not that we've got two separate companies, but we're working with the board on this working together document. That's going to be the arrangement in which we can make things happen in a collective partnership with the board as it stands just now. So we will set up our Acts at Article Association, that's how we run. This will have their way of running it, and together we'll work on this whole document of how we can interact more, more closely. That process has already started. In the meantime, we still have Jerry, Ian, and the group here doing everything they can to give us the, the best on, on the pitch. I'll give you an example of what we're talking about here. If there is any significant action right now on the stadium name, change the team, colours, etc, etc. Partick Thistle already have within their Articles Association that that must be a unanimous decision by the board. When we go through with this transition, we'll have an extra member on our board, we'll have five fan representatives on the Partick Thistle board. So any stadium name change, anything like that, has to be agreed by the board. Further to that, and again, as it exists right now today, in Section 5, the shareholders may, by special, special resolution, that means 75% of the shareholders, which will be what we will represent as fans, can direct the directors to take or refrain from taking specified action. So actually, literally today, this exists. And by us becoming the, the majority of fan ownership, it gives us greater control of some of those really, really strong emotive decisions that the club take. It doesn't slow the club down. The directors still run the club, Jerry's still putting the team out there, no one's picking the team for them. But what it does is those major decisions on how we develop the club is now in our holding. It's our responsibility to, to help put that together. The voice of the fans, going through the majority, majority shareholder, putting this unique relationship from the fans directly into the, into the board, which hasn't existed before. And with us being gifted it, it's even more unique because we're not paying back any debt we're actually being able to influence some of those decisions, bringing in extra monies and funds for the club itself. So again, I want a slight apology for the dryness of this. I know there's a lot of information in it, but it's important to recognise the relationship between the parties here. So, how do we get there? We already drafted uh, legal and governance documents, but these have to be agreed by the members of the Foundation. Um, elections to the board will be going out before the AGM notifications for people who want to be part of that and we'll complete and agree those articles of association at that AGM meeting which is coming up. Really, really important is this working together document. Um, any discussions we've had with the board, they want this to happen, they're committed to this happening. They can't have it being disruptive, we need uh, Jerry, we need Ian to focus on getting us as close as we can to the Premier League although maybe the pitch will be a bigger problem with that. But the problem here is we don't want to distort any of that. We want to focus on the team being the best that it can be. We know there's a great rapport between the fans and the pitch. We know that that has to continue. So when we have these discussions, this is all in process. This is not delineating or taking us away from what we want to achieve as a football club. We want to get promoted and we should support that as much as we can without letting any of this interfere with it. The third point on here is also very, very important, that we have to demonstrate that we are a competent entity. And by competent means that this is a big financial asset that we transferred to a company that's just been set up. We have to make sure and, and make sure that we are in a good position to be successful with that transfer and not the shock party thistle going forward. So all the feedback is gratefully received, all of the input is received, everything that we can possibly use to show that we will be taking this club forward 
in a better way than it's been done in the past would be great. And the key to that is the membership from the Jags Foundation. If we turn around, how many members do we have just now? About 430. About, about 430. That, that's basically not enough. Um, you can say you're a majority fan, we 430 people. Um, so we have to get that membership up. Part of that authenticity of who we are and how we take this club forward comes from increasing that membership. So that's a big part of what we need to do. All of this then takes us into that fan ownership position. We will then gain that control and influence of the club. Now we start to talk about where we take the club from here. So with that, Andrew, I'll hand it back over to you. We have put down some you know, long-term visions, ambitions, but you know, Andrew's got maybe more uh, graphical example of how we actually do that. Sure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, you get a bit more of an understanding as to, as to what we're looking at, but what can we actually do moving forward? I think the challenge tonight, and from now on in, is for everyone to get involved and give suggestions and ideas. Um, we've got some ideas that we're present to you just now, and that we've kind of pulled together for some, some, for, from some fan engagement. As it stands right now, we don't really have a see. First we'll do listen to the fan base, but moving forward we'll have a real powerful voice. Some of the ideas we had is that it may be a case of we want to have maybe free travel to, to midweek away games. Um, maybe a case of um, we want to have free access to, to Jackson on YouTube. Maybe a case of we want to have a, a monthly event where all fans can go to hear from the manager or player or directors or former players or what kind of events that are structured. Maybe they want a, more of a focus on the youth of the club, might look at other clubs and think, well, we'll get more of that. So what do we do? We use the money, we go and get the best young coaches and the best scouts the money can buy. Um, maybe they want to have entertainment in the Saturday. We might go out there and want to have a real attractive brand of football, entertain the fans, so we back the right manager to get the types of players that need to be squad. Um, we might, might want to develop certain areas of the ground. We might have to. We might want a veto on, on ground sharing. We might want to invest in a top drawer hybrid pitch so we have any issues with playing service we've seen recently. It might be as simple as we want to access the digital media across the stadium, Wi-Fi, charging points, um, so that you can kind of follow the game, maybe vote man of the match, you've seen that in some other clubs there just now. But as I said before, the sky's the limit. It's, all of this is up to us. If the club's biggest investor passionately wants something to happen, what directors going to say no? Now, we might be in the middle of a cost of living crisis where everyone seems to be more and more expensive and, and we all need to prioritise our expenditure on a monthly basis. My challenge for you tonight is to think about making Party Thistle and joining the Jack Foundation as part of one of those priorities each month. It's a chance to join something uniquely special. It's a chance to stand shoulder to shoulder with your fellow fans, no matter who they are, what they do, or as I said earlier, the level of commitment they have. Your opinion will be heard. This is your chance to really affect things in a positive way. It's your chance to sculpt the club the way, the way you want over the next kind of 20, 30, 100 years. When Aristotle said, the whole of Partick Thistle is greater than the sum of its parts, he meant to say was if we, if we join together, we can achieve more than we can separately as individuals in the stands. So I'm asking everyone to make some sacrifices, but as we do on a regular basis for important things in our lives, and make it for the club that we love. Okay. Hopefully that has uh, helped you kind of understand exactly where the Jacks Foundation are going to be, where they are wanting to be and how they want to kind of move the club forward. We'll now invite questions from all the audience. Uh, Alan Heron will be taking the majority or answering the majority of the questions. As we said earlier, um, if you've got something maybe from a legal standpoint, Stuart's here to answer that um, as best he can and the board are obviously on hand here as well. Should we maybe not get around all the questions tonight, 
Uh, the gangs will be available for just a quick chat after. They're absolutely more than happy, uh, gents uh, and everyone that's here tonight, they're more than happy to, to have a face-to-face -face chat with you. If there's something maybe you don't want to hear out in public, or something maybe you want to ask them individually, uh, then the board are absolutely more than happy. So if you could just show your hands for anyone that's got a question, and we'll come to you first, man over here. If you can tell us your name and then your question, please. My name's Ian Jenkins. The uh, question is uh, to, to you, David Brown. David, you mentioned that uh, it has been a unanimous decision for the board. Does that mean the existing directors could veto something that the trust put forward? And, sorry, you, you, existing directors of... So you do, there's going to be directors appointed by the trust yes. and there'll be existing directors who want a minority sharing. The yes. minority sharing directors, can they veto something? Because you mentioned earlier on that has to be a uh, unanimous decision. No, they couldn't veto it as a unanimous decision. So, no, so, so what I mean is, so let's just say Jack Trust agree, and let's say we change the colour strip, okay? Yeah. yeah. So Jack Trust won't do that, but the existing directors don't. Could you put a block on decisions that the trust make? So, so the, I think the article says quite clearly that it's either an action that could be stopped or an action that could be implemented. So they could, the majority, if it comes to that, I think it's called exclusive action, 75% people want to do it, then we can make that, that call. So all decisions, so all decisions made by the board is actually majority, not unanimous. Is that correct? It's unanimous. The odds of using this as it goes is unanimous. Yeah. Oh, right, thank you. That's, that's a good sound, actually. Stuart, do you want to follow up on that? Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm Stuart Rennie. Um, I'm a partner in the Guinness Local Firm of Lawyers, and I give legal advice to the Jacks Foundation. The question, <laughs> the complex question is the bumper corporate governments uh, sometimes involve detailed and boring explanations and that's probably what you're about to get. The key in all these things is that the basic thing to point to remember is that the directors manage the operations of the company. The shareholders exercise control. Okay. Now I can't and don't have a copy of the official articles to hand to look at the specific article we're talking about but I think the general point to be made is that on certain decisions, key decisions like Naming the naming, changing the name of the stadium um, and changing uh, the strip or, or, or sell, selling, the, selling the club in total, that has to be taken as a unanimous decision. And that is seen in general as a positive thing because the fans representative on the board don't block that. But the point, sorry, you made is correct. The reverse is true that if it has to be unanimous, then a rebel director could block the point being made. There are a number of, number of solutions regarding that. Ultimately, as a 55% majority shareholder in the club, we can remove any director. So we can, that would be the ultimate step that we can, we can take. And that's, that, that step is open to any, di any director. That's why David Beatty moved in and could remove directors at that point, and then, then ping pong the, the reverse with when Jackie Lowe and Colin Muir to, to that company. Um, I think it would be very strange for a director to take a decision that was backed by not only the majority owner, but the majority of the majority of fans. So you have to look at you have to look at that in the round. The, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a thing called good faith here that all the thistle directors, all thistle fans are normally thistle direct, thistle directors are normally fans. The, the people here and the people attending tonight are thistle fans, and we're all trying to pull in the same direction. The, the, there are issues where directors take decisions for the commercial benefit of the club because they have statutory duties that say they must act in the best interest of the club and they have to take that decision. And that can sometimes con conflict with the, the, the interest of the fans. The stadium naming is a great thing. We're allowed to sign a, the, we had a previous deal with energy, en the Energy Check Stadium at Fur Hills. Nobody ever called it that. But, ever, but we got a substantial amount of money in to the club for doing that. And I think as a director, where you've had to look at after the financial interest of the, of the club, that would be a, a difficult decision to take if there was opposition from the fans versus their substantial duties. So it, it's a fair point to me, but it's not a, a critical point. We haven't had any examples of the unanimity not being forced. And I think you've got to, you have to look at these things realistically. 
you don't, yes, there is, in, in theory, there is a risk of killing one rebel director, you hold everybody else to ransom. But there's an ultimate solution to that, you get rid of the rebel director, and that bearing in mind that all thistle directors are only on this, nobody, nobody makes a fortune out of being a thistle, being a thistle director, we're not offering a huge salary to everybody to, to come on board. But the only reason people take these decisions is for the benefit of the club, and that is, like, does, that, does that help to that answer the question? Yes. Next up, we'll on that side, let me get you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Donald, you possibly know me, unfortunately. Um, obviously, we've been shown there the difference between the Jacks Foundation board and the club board. Well, I know it's, uh, obviously we said about the 55%, but how much uh, sort of fan percentage will be on the actual club board as well? Hi there. Uh, just as, as my first word of the night, Gavin mentioned earlier on about there being no such thing as a silly question. I'll try and not uh, demonstrate that there are such a thing as silly answers. Uh, at this point in time, there are four people on the board that you could describe as being representatives of the fans. Got Gavin, who was appointed towards the end of last year. There's also Alan and Andrew from the PTFC Trust, plus John Penman who was part of the Thistle Forever campaign and I think it would be fair to say they are they're regarded by the other members of the board as fan reps. The uh, statement that was issued last October said that at the point this year transfer they'd like to take on another board member from, uh, from the Jags Foundation. So at that point that would effectively take it to five and that would be about 50% of the total uh, in terms of what's there. And we're still to have detailed discussions with the club about that, but I think probably maintaining that type of uh, balance going forward would be what we we're looking for. But again, as has been said, once we have the shares, we are the majority shareholder, effectively once you get to that point, every director is there with our consent, passive or, or, or active. So, uh, so as I say, it, there will be that balance, but we, we would still have that ultimate uh, control. Do you want to follow up, Donald? You okay. Next question, please. Any other questions over there? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Danny Crawford. I have two questions, really. One is, um, you say that the uh, when the the assets transfer from the Three black cats. There is a value of ten million pounds. Is that simply the the stadium and the ground, or is there other assets included in that figure? And the same question, which I hope is a tough one, is what happened to Falkirk? Because I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want it all with Falkirk. Uh, yeah, the figure. Uh, I mean, I think it was a, a figure of about five million that reported, and I think that was a combination of uh, three point four for the shares and also as part and parcel of the same deal the balance of that amount was to buy the 50% of uh, the Cropco shares representing the city end of the ground. Uh, now that that hasn't been covered but that will also be transferred over to the Jags Foundation but that will happen after we have assumed the majority shareholding uh, that's basically beneficial in tax terms. Next question up there. It's five million pound, not ten. Yeah, five million pound. Yeah. Well, I'm the poker. Oh, there was a rally. <laughs> That's not a question. Uh, I hope not to start one. My name is Bill Sweeney. Um, it's a question about the election and re-election of my uh, directors. You say quite correctly that there will be three up each time for the election, but there is no limit on the number of times uh, that people can be re-elected. Uh, correct me if that's wrong, but uh, if that is my understanding is right, I would argue that you should build in, you should build in uh, an element of rotation that people should, after a certain number of terms, either two or three at most, step aside for a period. This is based on uh, my experience with membership organisations in the music business where 
for all of the best reasons, at times people just hang on, and some of the not so best reasons, but people can't uh, hang on, and the world changes about them, and your organisation suffers because you can't uh, do it. So I would argue for there being some form of uh, number of terms after which you should step aside, and then come back in by all means. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a fair point, to be fair. Um, certainly very open to, uh, to accommodating that. I uh, say so step aside if, if it doesn't actually kill you first. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions in the audience at Don? Sorry, up the back. Sorry, we'll go to the back. We'll come back down there in a second. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Andrew Waddle. Um, my kind of a follow up to that guy just before that can you also put a clause in that your first directors, you don't really want them all to do three terms and then all scarper at the same time. That's not a sensible idea for the organisation. And so I, I would be keen to make sure that in the first set there are th three of the directors um, I, I only go for three years and three except they're only going to go for six years so that you have a rotation and so that you have youth and DNA uh, going on. So it's a really important point at the beginning that you don't have a grouping who become a cabal who are permanent for the first nine years and then, and then no succession. So if, if you could try and put that into your governance Think it would be a really healthy step. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be fair to say. I think there are one or two of the people on the uh, on the board that aren't intending to be staying around for the longer terms. So I think that would happen anyway. Uh, but let's say, you know, what we're looking for is to get a, a combination of the just actually retaining the skills uh, with 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 uh, with a turnover. Any follow up on that? No, Next question. Uh, thanks, my name is Neil Roden. Uh, I think it might be useful if we just picked up some of the governance codes that already exist, you know, like for public companies and, and others where there is best practice recommendations, and I think it is nine years for directors to be imposed precisely because they become too comfortable, lose a bit of touch, etc., etc. And I think we don't have to reinvent a lot of wheels here, we just have to pick up the way that other companies operate and incorporate that into how we operate. I think the, the point behind me was, was well made as well, that we need to get some continuity but not make sure that everybody leaves at the same time. I've got one other question which has probably a lot of people. What's happening to the other trusts in this process um, who are often the same people? or cross over with the same people because we've got the foundation, the trust and the JAGS trust all with sort of one assumes similar agendas and that, but slightly different corporate entities if I could put it that way and I'm, I'm confused as to what their role is after the club becomes fan owned. Okay thanks, I'll take the first question about the um, articles. Um, that is actually um, your vision is converted to you because as a lawyer I don't like doing very much work and um, I like charging for it. Um, the first thing I would say is that the, we, the articles that are being drafted to say are based on the model articles produced by the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, which is a fairly good standard um, used throughout um, both um, voluntary organisations and the charity sector. I had to make quite a few alterations to that to reflect the specific nature of a fan owned football club particularly just uh, taking in um, ideas and suggestions from people like the Foundation of Arts and um, Motherwell um, and having a look at other, other um, articles or associations. But that, that we are using the SCDO articles as the best practice for voluntary organisations like this. And they, are, they provide for things like um, no extension of directors' terms um, and uh, revolving directors um, so, so, that you get the, so you get the turnover. Um, the other thing, point I think I should make is that the current envision is that one third of the directors will retire every year. So, you're, so on a basis of a board of nine, that would mean a churn of directors every three years, not six or nine years that you're, talk, you're talking about. Your, your first term of office is going to be for, for three years. Because you want to try and keep the organisation fresh, you want to try and get um, new ideas and new stimulus. And hopefully, um, newer members coming through, younger members coming through um, to let us old people retire. <laughs> so that, that is where we are with the article. I'll let um, Sir Alan answer the question regarding the status of the other uh, fan ownership trusts. 
I'll stand up. Uh, that may or may not be a good thing that you can see me. Uh, we have had discussions with the PTFC Trust. Uh, that was, if you remember, effectively the first part of Colin Weir's gift to the fans when he cleared the club debt. Uh, and uh, in principle, they are in agreement that they should be transferring the funds over to the Jags Foundation, but we're still early days with that. And any transfer will probably only take place after the, the shares have been uh, transferred. Uh, as for the Jags Trust, uh, Donald, uh, who asked the question earlier, is actually the secretary of, of that organization, uh, who, uh, who took over from me 10 years ago when I threw it at him and ran away. Uh, but. Uh, there is a, a technical issue with that. Uh, we do need to get involved with the Jags Trust, and I've said to Donald tonight we will be in touch for some, some discussions. The combined effect of the 55% of the Black Capsule so, and the just under 20% that are owned by PTFC Trust puts us just under 75% of the shares. Once, if we were to look to transfer the Jags Trust shares into the Jags Foundation as well. We trip something on the club's articles of association that mean we have to offer to buy everyone's shares. They don't have to accept that offer, but clearly if we get to that point, we need to make sure we've got the funds to allow us to uh, to be able to follow through in that. Now, I think it's certainly been suggested a lot of fans really don't have, they made there's a lot of people have about 10,000 shares none of them have them from the point of view of uh, building up a nest egg and I suspect uh, you know most of them would rather just continue having knowing that they've got that little slice of the club but at the same time we wouldn't want to be down that uh, step unless we were sure of the financial side of things but we will be from the PTFC trust eventually that will join in and then we will be looking to, uh, to link up the Jags trust in some shape or form as we go forward. Thank you very much. Any other questions on the floor at the moment down the front there? Uh, hand up, give me a second. Uh, Graham Nisbet. Yep. Alan, see, see the, the party thistle trust? 22%. Uh, and the 55, that takes us over that 75 limit. It's just under 20%. It's under 20? Yeah. Right, so we're not at that 75 limit that we need to buy out at that point. <coughs> Any other questions in the room? Yes, sir. Uh, Scott Grant. Um, just a question really about the transfer of the shares from Three Black Cats. How's yeah. that progressing? And is there a timeline in place for that? Well, we're, we're looking to see if uh, the joint statement last October suggested June as a time. We are certainly trying to work to see if we can get to that position to do that. Effectively, uh, David mentioned that we're on about you know, uh, kind of being a credible organisation, etc, etc. That's the two aspects. Firstly, three black cats have to be happy that they're passing it on to someone who's uh, not going to screw things up, to put it mildly. And secondly, the board as such on the transfer of the shares then have to be able to certify to the SFA that uh, we're fit and proper people. Whatever that may mean. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what we're looking to do, I mean, since the, the joint statement, we had the, the other semi-lockdown and all the rest. So we are trying to see if we can get to that. It means actually pumping up the activity with the club, but at the same time, the club's actually kind of very focused on uh, looking to see if we can get promoted this year. So. And I think in terms of the point David was making about not wanting to get in the way of that, it may make the, uh, the date that we actually do the share transfer a bit variable. But, but the basic principle that we're looking at just, just remains the same. Is there a number of members? I think maybe that's another question. Is there a number of members that perhaps the, the Jags Foundation want to get to to help you know, attain that kind of fit and proper process that we have? Well, we can, we've been looking at a, a general number of uh, you know, about a thousand, or I mean, that would that would then equate to more than a hundred thousand pound a year in uh, in cash coming in. We've never we've not had any specific 
discussions with uh, either three black cats or the club or what expectations they have about the members that we certainly uh, you know want to increase that. I mean we know that there's something like 2,300 season ticket holders so from that point of view that, that's an audience that we want to get you know a higher proportion of the season ticket holders who are not signed up yet to, uh, to join in. Any other questions on the floor this evening? Again, yes. Did you ever have any deals with Michelle Evans? And the reason I'm asking that is because for the past 10 years I've sponsored a player strip every year. And when Michelle was here, she had a lot of ideas, a lot of energy, a lot of passion. She wasn't a Thistle fan, but she brought a lot of fans felt belonged to the club because of the work she's put in. Recently, uh, myself or a couple of people have been a bit disillusioned with uh, talking to the club about various things and you send emails and they bounce around and they don't get replied. You mentioned earlier on that you have a sum of money. Could you use some of that to employ someone to act as a community liaison officer or a liaison officer between yourself and the other 1,700 fans or season tickets who don't, who are not a member of the foundation? Well, uh, from my point of view, I didn't know Michelle. I don't know. I don't know whether Gavin had something. I'm using Michelle as an example because I'm a friend of Michelle who was here. I felt really part of the club. I felt I belonged. And she was just enthusiastic. And when she left, I just I felt like crumbled. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in a situation where I don't know because uh, I didn't know Michelle. Right. Uh, okay, yeah, but so maybe. At the moment, there's only 300 people here, right? Yeah. And we've got 2,300 season ticket holders. We need to increase some in membership. Could you spend some of the funds we have to employ someone who could do that? In theory, yes. Once we've got the funds, yes, we could. But you see, the other one, you had almost 100,000 pounds to donate to the club this year. No, no, that's what we'd be getting if we had a thousand members. Okay. Uh, so I mean, we're you know. A, we're not at that level just now, and we've just been starting to take monthly contributions from from October. So at this stage in time, you know we've got money, but we don't have money where we could, you know, volunteer volunteer money for that. Uh, okay. uh, my question was kind of related to that, just about plans for trying to drive um, an increase in membership. Because I think at the moment, with it being um, very much an online focused campaign. It's been quite difficult to catch the kind of walk ups and the guys that would just maybe sign up if there was something downstairs in the concourse. Is there any, um, well, I presume there's plans for that, but is there any complication at the moment because we're not technically part of club ownership? So there's a bit of a kind of. No, I think I mean, you're absolutely right, Scott. I mean, I think as much as anything, we've been, been limited by, by the COVID restrictions at this point in time but I think you know the idea of actually having a more active presence on match days with uh, laptops and mobiles at the ready and, and mug people as they uh, come in uh, would, uh, would would certainly help. I mean just actually being there and available for asking questions is just going to generate more interest as well. I mean I think I think we're aware from you know all of us speaking to people that uh, that you know there's there's still a job to do that in terms of getting the message out, but uh, as I say, circumstances are made it largely online and uh, a bit remote. So it's something that we need to uh, kind of uh, ramp up our activities on. We'll come back down to the front in a second. No, it's, it's, this this is very much following on from these uh, the last two questions. Sorry, Callum Stewart. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely crucial. There's been a lot of talk about board of directors and processes, which obviously is very important. But ultimately, we're talking about getting down to the individual fans. And you know, Ian made a good point about feeling involved. If you feel involved with the club in general terms, you're more likely to sign up to the Jags Trust. Uh, and also, th therefore, I think it's, it's quite important in the, the kind of publicity and, and the, the, the selling of this whole idea the individual fans really feel that if they do sign up, they've got real ownership. And I, I mean, I, I know it's not that easy, but that their individual views, whatever they might be, there is a process which these views will go right up the chain, if you like. Um, and, you know, obviously, an individual views. 
will have a range regarding success of the club, etc. But at least that these views can be aired and as I say, well, well. So I think, you know, backing up the, the last two speakers, that uh, individual fan aspect is important. Yeah, to, to the extent that that was a question, the answer is yes. <laughs> Alan, you see, the, when the foundation was brought up, people were asked to sign up. Just now, we're asking for people to sign up, and we've still more than 430, probably 30 more than we had before. Do these people, uh, the fans, think that when they're signing up, they're actually part of the foundation without donating anything on a monthly basis. From the from the original back, you know, 12 months ago, before the foundation was was actually legally set up, we did we did ask for email addresses, and I think that was really in the back of the Thistle Forever campaign. Uh, we still have all these email addresses, and we are filtering out those that uh, have joined and we're continuing to either send polite emails or harassing them uh, about, about joining up. So we know, we know who these people are <coughs> from the point of view of uh, trying to kind of continue a conversation with them. But uh, one of the things we don't want to do is exclude fans that for whatever reason can't afford to join. So people can still sign up as what we've described as a, a friend of the foundation. So they will continue to get any communications from us, but they won't be full members, so when it comes to things that require a vote, they won't have a vote. But we do want to make sure we're inclusive as possible and, and not just limiting ourselves to the people that can, uh, that can uh, kind of uh, afford the, uh, the, the contribution. Any questions for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll introduce myself with some trepidation because my name's Tom Morton, uh, but that's my only association with you. Um, Alan, uh, you mentioned about the transfer of shares and the time scale. Did I understand you correctly that really that's under the control of three black cats? They will transfer when they deem the Jags Trust fit and proper. So, so they're really in control of the time scale. Fundamentally, yes. Yeah. And have they said what they think is fit and proper so that we know what we're aiming for? Well, I mean, I, mean, I think what they're looking to do is to make sure that we have... That's actually part and parcel of the Working Together Agreement we started discussing with the club, which is going to define effectively how we're going to interact. And that kind of provides protections for both sides of the scenario. I mean, we've talked earlier on about you know, how we can go into an AGM and have a special resolution and force the board to do things. Or if you've got a rogue director, you can, uh, you know, we've got the power just to remove them and solve the problem that way. In many ways, I mean, these are kind of nuclear options and are really an indication of something not working in the relationship between uh, the foundation and the club board. Uh, when, you know, so I, I think that's really the guts of the matter. When we get to a good agreement there, and that's going to be an awful long way down the way to uh, kind of confirming ourselves as, as fit and proper. Thank you. Any other correct dog? Yeah. Uh, I promise I'm not a plan question type style, but where do you see this? feasibly being in five years time? Uh, in five years time, I won't be a member of the Jags Foundation Board. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, personally, I just hope in five years time, we've, we've got uh, a vibrant board on the Jags Foundation uh, with a positive relationship with the club board at that time, I would imagine that five years down the line we'll have a very different board of directors. Not not because we're going in there to kick anyone out or anything, but just the the passage of time will uh, will there will be some churn there. 
I mean, one of one of the big jobs, the big ongoing jobs, if you like, is uh, you know to understand you know what the people that are currently on the board, what their thoughts are. In terms of time, we need to start looking to get uh, some potential people to become board members. One of one of the things we want to discuss as part of the working together uh, arrangement is for us to define, if you like. Uh, lapse into HR speak here, you know, the kind of people skills that you're looking for, what skills are you looking for for somebody that's going to be in the board of directors. Also to understand across the range of the board what skills would, you know, the collective members of the board have, uh, so that we can then know who we're looking for, uh, so that uh, if we've got new directors coming on board, uh, you know, we can we can come to joint agreements about you know who's you know who's actually appropriate. And to be honest, that can apply to anyone that the, the Jags Foundation are looking to elect as well. Uh, you know, they will be directly elected by Jags Foundation members, but at the same time, there's still also people that would be more than appropriate to serve on the board of directors. You know, which at the end of the day, you know, illegal legal uh, responsibilities and all that, it's it's at a slightly different level from just serving in a committee. Uh, so there's more to it than that. But I, and I'd say I would like to see that, you know, five years down the line that we are contributing, uh, you know, a healthy amount of, of money to the club each year, which again stresses that's additional to what the club should be doing because at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the club sport and directors to finance its operations on the park. Uh, we can then hopefully provide some additional revenue for that. And as part and parcel of that, I say, I'd like to see a situation uh, where you know we know what projects the, the club are looking to do. You may find a situation where the club can identify three or four things that they, they want to do over the season. And the budget means they can do three of them can we pick up the fourth one? And it may very well be, I'd like to get to a situation where we could put uh, a vote to the members or which of the four would we like to be associated with? And it can then be appropriately matched. And I'd also like to see us in the Premier League at that point as well, by the way, just, just as a slight aside for our fourth season. <laughs> can I give a good mixture uh, I think that's a really good oh, question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd like to think I can make myself proud anyway, uh, but won't do any harm. Yeah, um, I think fan ownership has the potential to really improve the governance of the club and the way it is run on and off the field, perhaps especially off the field. By a bit, you know, this isn't suggesting that a revolution is required, but if we're not going to make things 10, 20 percent better, then what is the point? From a supporter's point of view, I think that the foundation's long-term role, uh, never mind all the process issues that we've talked about, is to build up the fan base, bring in money, um, improve the supporter experience, and fucking win something before I die, basically. That's what I said. Yeah. 1971, 50 bloody years, and not, you know, a few more lower league trophies. No, we actually want to build the reserves of the club, build its financial position, build its supporter base, and be challenging for cups again. If St. Johnston can do it, a similar fan base, and the same sort of money, why can't we? So yeah, that's five years now. Come to Michael now. Thanks, Gavin. <coughs> Sorry, Michael Max here. Um, I just want to ask, I don't even know if this is really a question or more a statement. You mentioned that Hearts and, and Motherwell were the most effective fan ownership clubs around. The problem or the reason for that is, by God, they needed financial input at the time of, of their building of their fan ownerships. I'm not convinced the, party, the general party thistle fan base are convinced at all by fan ownership. And I think that's the hardest part that you guys have. I appreciate that the moment the choices that we have as fans are what we currently have with the three black cats or the fan ownership model and that's why I think most of us feel that we have to try and look at, at that as the best alternative out of what we have but the question for you guys is how on earth do you translate that to the general fan base? The numbers tonight indicate that 
large numbers of fans are not convinced, or are just not, I don't, don't mean not convinced by what you're offering, but not convinced by fan ownership in, in general. You guys have to put something out there that is going to attract the interest of every single supporter and fan of Partick Thistle that's out there. How best do you think is the best way of achieving that? Yes, I agree entirely with you. I mean, the fact that we are not having to be kind of saving up money over the next few years to pay to someone else to to, to, to get the majority shareholder uh, is is both great and a big challenge. Uh, I mean, I also know that there's a lot of people have said that they'll join up once a share transfer happens. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of people, as you say, might say, well, why are we saving this, you know, why are we needing to pay this money? Uh, you know, it, but it's, it's very much for, you know, we want to add to it. I mean, interesting thing from all of the Scottish equivalents, you know, you've got, uh, you know, Harps and Motherwell were the, the main ones, uh, mostly because it was all their documentation that we looked at and filched and we were putting stuff together. Uh, but you've also got, you know, St Mirren, and uh, say that word again, Morton, uh, all working very kind of similar things, but they all made a very deliberate decision that once they'd reached that first goal, that they would retain the uh, the model of, of, of pledging or subscriptions to add in. What we've got to do is find a way of actually getting the second part of that message over as positive and enticing despite the fact that we didn't have the first half of it. You know, that, that, the idea that you need to spend the next four years throwing money in a pot to get rid of so-and-so can be, you know, very uh, enticing. But we, we've got to work our way around that, to be honest. I think the question I had kind of links to that in a way um, around the sort of strategic direction and in, in practice, how is that set going forward? Because from the outside looking out at the moment, um, I'm not sure what the strategy of the club is. Is it, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I couldn't even you know, have a guess what the, the strategy is. So how does that work in practice going forward? Who sets that, presumably? <coughs> the majority shareholder, and the board have to then offer that? Well, one of, one, of, one of the parts of the, uh, I mean, basically, if you get into the, the old speak, where we will be looking to get involved uh, more involved is setting the strategic direction for the club. Once that's done, the board of directors got on with the day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, you know, so so that's fine. But again, that's part and parcel of the, the overall uh, discussions we're just entering into with the board. I mean, at this point in time, do you know are they working from a long-term strategy? Are they or are they just kind of going from season to season? I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things we want to, to get to grips with is because the last two or three years have been very different because of COVID. You know, so you know, and we know that the club kind of got successfully through that, but we need to get you know just a sense of what the the books look like and might appear in the future once you strip that out, uh, and then you know look, look to build some strategic direction from that. Uh, you know, it might look to you know five years five-year plan, whatever, and then look to, to build towards that, because there's, you know, there's a lot of big issues that we know about. We, we all know about the pitch. Uh, we all know about the stadium. Uh, you know, in terms of that, there's lots of maintenance uh, been needing there. Uh, it was mentioned today. And, you know, as I say, this is kind of a the type of thing that certainly would require debate amongst the fans. You know, when do you reach the point in terms of the overall cost of maintaining what's on here at Fort Hill uh, against going elsewhere? Uh, you know, it's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, what opportunities might we get once we have full control of the kind of city end of the ground? terms of making use of that. They're, they're gigantic questions that, you know, as like I said, probably ones you can all kind of uh, think up yourself, but we're, you know, we're certainly nowhere near having discussions at that. I mean, at this point in time, we're very much focusing on getting over the line for the share transfer. 
but we will have to start kind of sitting down to the club and looking at some of these longer term directions as well. Next question over here. Right. Hi, it's uh, Martin Tours. Uh, so I'll just start by saying something about <coughs> big news. I was going to say that Michael Max made a very good point there. Um, in that because there hasn't been some sort of disastrous thing where we're at death's door or back to say the Jags, that does make obviously trying to get fans involved. You know, places always brings people together, but obviously because it's uh, the shares have been gifted and things are okay at the moment on and off the pitch to a degree, you know, that does make it harder to sort of motivate people. The question I had was again just a little bit to do with this difference between owning and running and operational decisions as to things. There was a sort of issue right at the start where it was shareholders eh, and obviously directors have to act in the best interest of the club. So say, just for an example, say somebody comes along and says, why don't you give the club a million pounds to call it the whatever Fathom Stadium? Um, and say fans though don't think they like that, don't like to say oh, it's the Saudi Arabian Royal Family Stadium, so hope we don't like that. But the board are saying we're gonna get a million pounds for it. Where does that come in? If the fans through the Jags Foundation say, No, we don't want that, we have to get clear to the the board of the Jags Foundation, no. But the other directors have obviously got a statutory sort of obligation to say, well, a million pounds is a million pounds. How does that pan out? Well, firstly, that is something that shouldn't come as a shock to us because that would be one of the things we are looking to be uh, consulted about before it happens. Uh, if it gets to that, you know, I'd say we've got the nuclear options. You know, I I think it'd be very very difficult to be. You know, there's two sides to that. One, the amount of money you get, and then two is who the hell's providing the amount of money. Uh, I think certainly if we found it we were looking to be uh, consorting with people that we didn't want to consort with, I would like to think that uh, the people on the board wouldn't, would, would realise that and would back out. But you know, at the end of the day, if the board go, go along a route like that, uh, that we didn't like and our members didn't like, and I think at that sort of point, that's the type of thing the directors of the foundation wouldn't be looking to make a decision like that uh, on our own. That's certainly something we would be looking to consult with the fans. Uh, uh, another good reason for becoming a member because you would have a vote in that scenario. Uh, we've, we've got the nuclear option, but that also has has bigger implications. Uh, from the point of view, if you had a situation like that and you wanted to <coughs> Kind of do the board. You might actually be looking to replace an entire board who potentially could all resign. So it's it's a good question. It's a tough one, though, because there are also other ramifications in terms of what you can do. But say the bottom line is we will have the tools to be able to deal with that. The question is, would it be appropriate to do so? And you know, where's the line between creating a bigger issue for yourself? than uh, the one you're resolving. Thank you. We'll get the last couple of questions or so tonight. We'll start wrapping things up in just a second. Um, if you've got any more questions, please feel free. Do remember though that the, the board members will happily chat to you um, for a period of time after tonight's event. Next question. Hi, uh, Joyce Quinn. So I'm considering myself a very ordinary fan. And if I taking away the main point tonight, it is that we want to get that 430 people that have signed up over the thousand so i can sit here with my hand and say you know i i'm one that hasn't yet put my money where my mouth is so i'm former season ticket holder um no longer because my commitments have changed i come to games when i can uh, i purchase the streams when i'm working away from home i purchase merchandise and so on and so forth and, and i'm a typical one of the many, many Jags fans out there. But I've had to look at my website to actually remind myself what it is you want. And, I, and I've looked and I've said it's, it's 10 pounds a month, is that right? Yes. That's all you want from me. Now, I get our concern about all our fans out there that can't afford that, and that's really important. But I can afford that. I spend more than 10 pounds a week on Costa Coffee. You know, I, I do, and I'm thinking, why, why have I not signed up? And the reason for that is, 
you've not excited me. So I'm on your mailing list. I've had the odd email. I knew the event was coming. I thought I better go along and find out what it's all about because it's not been communicated. And I, and I get the COVID thing. That's 100% genuine. It's it's everybody. Every organisation's in the same the same boat just now. You know, speaking to their members, speaking to their employees. It doesn't matter. COVID, COVID. We can come out of that. We must excite people. Tell them what it is they're going to get out of being a member of the Jags Foundation. I know you can't set it in stone because there's a lot of ifs, buts and maybes, but it's marketing and it's passion. And every time you've got a, a stream on, have, a, have an advertise. Advertise at half time. Have you signed up yet for the Jags Foundation? Come on, come on folks, let's, let's get behind the team. You know, the guys on the radio should do it, the social media guys should do it. Just sell the benefits, appeal to people's hearts. The, the chapter at the beginning, you know, warmed my heart and I thought, yes, that's what I want. But you've not reached out to folks. You know, I, I need to go home and, and convince my husband that he needs to pay £10 a month and I need to pay £10 a month because we are, we are Jags fans and we've not done it yet and we can afford it. So you need to start with people like us and get the passion out there and let's all get behind it. I think all I can say to that is absolutely. <laughs> and if anyone's interested, I think uh, Caroline's got a laptop with her, so <laughs> if you want to join up tonight, you can do so. And pass you over to Craig. Hi, Craig Dunn. Um, I think Joyce, you must have been listening in on, on, on uh, Andrew's um, Zoom calls because he's got that same passion. I think I completely agree. It, it has been difficult, and you're right. It's, it get, we have reached a point um, where there's only so long you can keep seeing COVID. Um, we recognise that, um, and I think that you know you will have seen not not massively, but but certainly over the last month or so that we have been more slightly more visible online. And um, we're starting to ramp that up, um, and we recognise that's something now that we can get on some of the things that have been picked up earlier. Um, you know, Andrews. One of the most enthusiastic of the bunch, as you can tell from from his passionate start, and that's something that we're all trying to take on board to, to get into the stadium. People like yourself and, and, and other people, particularly the, 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 the young team, if you want to, for want of a better term, you know, there, there are people out there who we can use to, to, to our benefit because at the end of the day, we're Jags fans, we want to see the Jags do well. That's why we're all here, that's, you know, that's what we want to do. We can get into the semantics of how it works, how the things go together, but at the end of the day, we, we're all here for the same reason as Andrew picked out at the start, which is that we bleed red and yellow. So I think we really acknowledge that point. Um, thank you for making it, Joyce. Um, and I think it's something that you can rest assured that we'll, we'll be picking up on going forward. I want to pick up on a thing from there as well, having seen similar things and what Joyce was talking about. When it comes to maybe advertising on the official club's stream, guys, is there maybe conflict of interest is perhaps the word, or you maybe see where I'm getting from. Would the current board allow you to do that? Would the club allow you to, because obviously at the end of the day you are taken, I'm obviously removed from this situation. I worked at Partick for so for a number of years I don't support Partick, which a lot of you know that. However, I've still got a big vested interest in the club. Um, as so, long as, we, as long as we beat you, that's all. No, <laughs> there's only one team winning the championship this year, and it's us. <laughs> so, <laughs> but apart from that, I'm not from my broth, I don't like smokies. Um, but my tractor's outside, so that'll help me. Maybe I'll make a good laugh like that. My, my, my kind of thing there is, you know, would the club see that? Obviously, the current board of directors, would they be happy with you? Because clearly, as Joyce said, you have to be a lot more. Kilmarnock have got a kind of similar thing just now with the Kelly Trust, who their kind of their kind of um, long term goal is to have fan ownership as well. And you see the model at Hearts, and you see the model at Motherwell, which are two completely different scales from each other. And you know, here it will be a, a smaller scale because you don't have the fan base that the, the clubs in Edinburgh have. So from that point of view, will the club allow you to use the ground, to advertise at the ground or to advertise on the official club stream for that? Or is that something you're going to have to do a little bit to yourself? And I've got a second point as well, sorry, about the young team. How do you engage? Now, with respect to everyone in here in the room tonight, I'm probably actually one of the youngest. I'm 35 and I'm probably one of the youngest. So I think from a younger person's representation it's quite poor and I think we can all say that tonight, we can all be pretty honest about that. 
Is it relatively poor? So how do you as a board communicate and engage with younger people? Do you do you buy way you get a younger committee in to help voice what you want to them? And I appreciate that's probably a little bit down the road. But the younger fans are the lifeblood of the club. Any club in Scotland going forward, it doesn't matter if you're if you're St Johnston or Motherwell or Kilmarnock or Broth or Elgin City, the younger fans are the ones that you also need to capture to enable them to want to spend money in 10, 15 years' time. Thanks, Gavin. I mean, um, apart from the fact that I have Boyfie Achilles and a hard paper round, <laughs> um, uh, I think it's the chat, you, you, your, your first point about, the, about the, the club allowing us to do things, I think they absolutely would. They do, they do for for the, the, the PTFC Trust, for the Jags Trust, who do things within the programmes and various th other things that happen. So, I th well, th 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 there's th th all of these things are, whether they're sponsorship or paid for, whatever, these things are achievable by one. Uh, um, uh, so there are things that can be done on match days and, and these are things that will pick up in due course. And in fact, it did happen when we first came back into the stadium very briefly, but it just didn't get, because of the circumstances, we couldn't really roll that out. Um, so absolutely, I think that's that's something that going forward in terms of engaging with um, with uh, the young team, for want of a better or, or, or the youth, I, I think you can see I think the passion from uh, from the John Lambie stand from these guys is there. You know they, 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 that's that's the type of thing that you know I've got uh, all of my kids involved as as um, a, well attendants and. and Photographers and various other things around around the ground, and they love it. They, they love the whole um, vibrancy of the game. They, you know, they, they they'll be the, the the next generation. How do you engage with them directly? You know, there's not many of them here tonight. Probably George is the only one that's been dragged along. Um, it, it's a difficult thing to do, but there has been there has been some engagement through some of the previous working groups with some of these um, some of these people. It's been difficult to do that across the pandemic. But that's something that we'd probably look to do more, for one of the way term, more forcefully, and, you know, by, you know, going along with the way have a conversation with them, but, you know, be involved, you know, for some of us actually take ourselves out of the Jaggy Husband stand and into the John Lambie stand to, to, to ask the questions and do those things. So um, I think that's it's an ongoing process, Gavin. I think it's it's, it's something that we're, we're, we're well aware of because ultimately these people are the, the future of the, of, the, of the club going forward. Any other questions tonight before we start to, yep, down the bottom there, thank you very much. Yes sir. Hi Alan Wallace, um, can I ask, is, is the commitment from Colin we are solid? In other words, if the board, the current board procrastinate and keep us kicking us down the road and someone comes in with a meaty offer, maybe wishful thinking, and they accept it, where are we? I'll take that one. Yeah, uh, that's a hospital pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Col well, yeah, Col Colin, um, we were very lucky uh, with Colin. With just Colin, I, I was very fortunate to to know Colin better than most of you. I, I worked with him in forum um, for a period of time, um, and notwithstanding his enormous generosity, a, a nicer man you could meet. You know, just a, a wonderful, wonderful person. And a, a great loss to to me personally and, and to the club. Uh, uh, um, in terms of of um, his, you, you know, what he gave and what he, he honoured to the club, there isn't le legally. I want to be, the, the, you know, the, there is no reason that the shares have to be handed over to us. They don't, you know. Um, the, the the reason that this is being pursued is because it was Collins' wish for that to happen. Um, uh, and it's because of that, and it's a, to, to honour that wish that, that we're all in this room tonight. Um, so the fact of the matter is, you know, you're right to say that potentially it could get kicked further down the road. I think it, what we're trying to do is get the Jags Foundation in a position where it's, it's, it has the backing of the fans, it has the support, and it big, makes itself an entity that three black cats and the board and everybody coming together feels that we are in a, the strongest position we can be to take that club, take this club forward, and um, and honour um, Colin's wishes. Do you any more questions? Just as we start now to to look to wrap things up. Stuart, sure you want to add to that? Yeah. Sure, I, was to add to that? I, I, I was just going to add to that um, point about um, the legal position is that 
nobody would know what Colin Weir's will says, and, the, and an instruction in, a, in his will to say that, the, that his shares must be given to a fan organisation would be quite hard to implement in, in legal contractual terms. But we have no doubt that three black cats have committed an awful lot of time and money to this project to set to, to advancing fan ownership at, at Party Thistle. Um, I made a joke earlier about uh, charging money. I don't charge for my time to, 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 to advise the tax foundation. We are all volunteers in this board. But that's not the case in front of you black cats. They've had to admit, uh, uh, had to spend a substantial amount of money in getting legal advice towards setting this up, towards um, progress, progressing the matter. There is, I, I will go put my neck and line about here, I think there's remains, there is and remains a substantial commitment from three black cats and all the people behind it towards fan, fan ownership and that, that we will have to persuade them that we are the, the, the body that, to take those wishes forward and that's why we want to, te to get more members and get more credibility and that's key to us to establish that we are the Jai's Foundation that is the credible body to take this forward but I think ultimately the destination will always be that this will be fan owned. Sure, thank you very much. And with that then, ladies and gentlemen, we shall bring this evening's um, proceedings to a close. Thank you very much to you for, for joining us tonight. As I said, uh, members of the board here will be will be happy to talk to you for a short period of time before we, we head home tonight. Thank you to you for coming. Uh, thank you to Gavin Taylor, Andrew Donnelly, uh, David Brown, also Craig Dunn, Alan Heron, and everyone else for coming tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And fingers crossed that uh, you can get everything and we can get everything across the line as well. The guys will obviously be communicating this. Again, the presentation will be available uh, within the next 24, 48 hours as well. As you may have seen tonight, everything is being filmed. The plan is maybe to have that on the YouTube channel, the website, within again the next 24 to 40 hours so you can look back at the whole event again tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Have a safe journey home. Thank you.